Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Great double feature for you today. Kyle Higgins starts things off. Kyle is back to uh, talk about his current work on Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Uh, yes, he is uh, adding to the mythos, including a new white ranger that's causing all sorts of trouble. Uh, it began in issue nine of the run. But, uh, you know, I need a really full uh, Mighty Morphin uh, primer to really understand the Power Rangers, and Kyle's very kind enough to do that with me. But we also talk about uh, his current image project, Hadrian's Wall, made with his cowl collaborators, Rod Rice and Alex Siegel. Rod is doing his usual amazing uh, artwork, and we talk about that. We talk about the collaborations with Alec. We also get an update on uh, Kyle's work in film. You might remember that uh, he made a short film, The League, that uh, led to his uh, image series, Cowl. The same goes with a uh, current movie project that he has. The film is called Shadow Hours, and uh, you can, in fact, uh, go to uh, the Shadow Hours website and check out that short film. But it's going to be great catching up with Kyle Higgins in part one of Word Balloon. Part two, uh, we speak with uh, Roger Anderson of ECC Frames. Roger is a big geek collector. We talk about some of his uh, favorite uh, pieces that he has, and also about his service, ECC Frames, which is sponsoring this episode of Word Balloon. ECC Frames is a custom framing business that uh, can handle uh, framing projects for comics, trading and sport cards, motion picture library, uh, lobby, motion picture lobby cards, uh, postage stamps and stamp sheets. Uh, records and EPs, LPs and EPs, movie posters, movie mylars, concert posters, original artwork and paintings, jerseys. He also can do boxes for things like uh, Funko figures, graded and ungraded video games, and graded and boxed action figures. It's a really neat business, but it gives us a chance just to talk about uh, some cool man cave stuff. And we also get into a year-end discussion of uh, the movies he liked and uh, didn't like TV shows. I'm kind of doing that now that it's the end of the year with a lot of our December Word Balloon guests. You're going to hear that a lot in the episodes ahead. But it's a really fun conversation with Roger Anderson, who is the owner of Eric Correct Comic Frames, eccframes.com. Uh, they are today's sponsor for Word Balloon. If you go there, you can see great examples of uh, the framed uh, comics that he has done. They are all very affordable. Something really to consider. If you've got a one-of-a-kind collectible and you really want to preserve it, it's not just enough to frame the thing. You want to present it. You want it there in your favorite room. And uh, we talk about that. And um, through ECC Frames, they've got great plans. Uh, even their standard uh, uh, economy plan uh, has a, a great-looking black frame, acid-free backing board, and UV-resilient acrylic for the glass for the frame. It's it's really a great way to keep your stuff looking fantastic. Also, you want to know that uh, if you do a deal with eccframes.com, uh, there's a promo code, Word Balloon, and it'll give you uh, money off your deal. So this is a great opportunity as far as a, a gift for someone that you know that has a great collectible and uh, this gives, gives them a much more sturdy and protective casing or framing to uh, keep it uh, looking pristine for uh, decades to come. ECCframes.com. All right, without further ado, let's get into our conversation with Kyle Higgins. We're glad to welcome Kyle back and uh, we were able to talk just last week, so I hope you enjoy it. Kyle Higgins, now on Word Balloon. Kyle Higgins, welcome back to Word Balloon. It's been a while, but you got some uh, neat projects going on right now, and I'm happy to talk to you about them. Yeah, man. Uh, thanks for having me. It's good to be back. The uh, <laughs> the funny thing is, uh, I was just thinking about this earlier today. Um, we, we've been trying to record this for a little while now, <laughs> and um, I don't know. I think I've been on Word Balloon, I think, three times. I don't know that I've ever recorded it uh, when I was like in L.A., like I think just you're the right, way, actually. yeah, the way the timing has worked out, just total coincidence. Each time, I've happened to be in Chicago when 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 we're recording, and obviously you're you're in Chicago as well. We're doing this over Skype, but um, I just think it's I think it's really wild that uh, you know, we're we're three for three now. That's true. Um, yeah. <laughs> so although we almost did it, we almost did it when I was in Dublin, but the time change uh, <laughs> kind of bit us in the ass a little bit. <laughs> No, I understand it. I felt bad. But yeah, I was like, are we still doing this? Aren't you in Ireland? And it's like, yes, I am. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Honestly, I had totally blanked on it. I I, I mean, I was going, well, I'm sure we'll get into this, but I, I was going through some stuff. And basically at the last minute, I just 
booked a trip to Europe <laughs> and like didn't tell anyone. And, uh, and I was like, I was staying with, uh, Declan Shalvey, uh, and Jordi Belair, although Jordi was, um, unfortunately she was in Florida, uh, while I was there, but, um, they had reached out to me and they're like, just, just come, come to, come to Ireland. You have a place to stay here. Use this as your central hub, use this as your central hub, you know, uh, and I'd been to Dublin before. So when I decided to just take a big trip to Europe and kind of make it up as I went, um, I figured I'd start in, in the one country that I have been to in Europe, which is which was Ireland, and That's starting awesome. Dublin. And basically, my mom told the entire country that I was coming because uh, we have a ton of family over there. Oh, that's great! <laughs> so, um, so it was a really good it was a really good first uh, first city to start in. Terrific! That's really cool, man. Excellent, man. I I got my family in Greece, so uh, I can appreciate that. That's that. I had no idea. I had no idea that you were Greek, John. No kidding. Oh, there you go, man. Are you, are you being facetious or what? I'm being facetious. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Do I talk about it all the time? Maybe I do. I know. I just know you. That's true. All right. That's true. There you go. The, the ruddy complexion obviously gave me away. But, <laughs> yes. uh, but yeah, man. No, uh, that's awesome. And uh, I have not been to Ireland yet, but I was uh, enjoying your, uh, your tour. I was following, you know, stuff on Facebook and Twitter from you. Yeah, yeah. It was... Um... <laughs> I have to thank uh, Arun Singh. He he came up with a pretty killer hashtag for me, the uh, uh, Kyle High Club, um, <laughs> and it was just basically everywhere I went and and just to to kind of chronicle the trip. And so yeah, yeah. I mean, it, when you <laughs> when you go through a shitty breakup, uh, sometimes you just have to run away to Europe and be cliched, you know. That's awesome, man. No, that reminded me of. Uh... God, it was in uh, The Prisoner. Patrick McGowan is just kind of going yeah. through some like options of countries to go to. And he's like, Ireland. He's like, yeah, maybe not. But he was just like kind of like <laughs> rolling through the European city uh, Rolodex of where he could maybe go. And he's actually, yeah. he said, Ireland, too cold this time of year, maybe, or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, I looked out. I looked out weather-wise um, pretty much in every city I went to. Because I went, um, I, I, the airfare was like so cheap um, right. right now. And so I flew, I got like a one-way ticket from... LA to Dublin at the last minute, like basically a week in advance, literally a week in advance. I got it for $430. That's fantastic. Holy shit. That's and amazing. I just had, yeah. And I had, I had a layover for an hour at JFK and that was it. Right. Like it was so easy. Um, and yeah, so I did Dublin and then I did, um, and then I did London and then I did Wales for a day, uh, then Paris and then back to London, and then Paris, uh, and then uh, Rome, and then I went through Florence. I, I was supposed to do more, like actually take a couple days in Florence, but I stayed longer in Rome. Um, and then, uh, and then where did, I, where did I go from there? I went to Barcelona, and then back to Paris for Paris Comic Con, uh, and then flew back to Chicago, and that's where I currently am. Spending the holidays with family, very nice. Yeah, well, I'm going. I'm going back to. Uh, I'm going back to LA tomorrow night, actually, for like two days to sort out um, some apartment stuff, so that after Christmas and New Year's, uh, I can just go back to LA and have a new place lined up and everything. So, That's cool. That's um, cool. Yeah, yeah. Are we going to see you maybe at the four star uh, Christmas party or? I d well, I wasn't invited because, and I don't know what that is. Well. So. Um, <laughs> that's you know that's Norton and Seely's. Uh, you can come as my plus one. I uh, that's Norton and Seely's studio. Oh oh okay yeah yeah yeah. So yeah, I mean you know it's the seventeenth. I don't know if you're back by then. Uh yeah no I'll be here. I'll, Excellent. I'm here I come back. Uh, I'm just I'm just in L A. Um, Thursday night tomorrow night. Wait what day is today? It's Tuesday. Tuesday. So tomorrow night yeah tomorrow night until uh, Saturday morning. Cool. So all right man there I, you go. We'll, we'll, We'll see each other in person. That would be lovely. No, absolutely. No, and, I, and I'm sure the guys would have if they knew you were going to be in town, you know. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. I, yeah. I, I, I know both those guys pretty well. And absolutely. I've, I've kind of just been on the – I've been, like, hiding out in the, in the suburbs uh, <laughs> and just <laughs> doing a ton of writing and, you know, Good. exercising and just kind of – yeah, just kind of regrouping a bit. And um, it's been really – it's been really nice, I got to say. Like, it's a – it's cool to have time and space to kind of process what I want to do next, what projects I want to really focus on going into 2017 and on the creator own side, as well as work for hire, sign some new stuff up, 
and then um, really make a big push on the on the directing front again. And a boy. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm plowing through the screenplay right now that I should have been done with like over a year ago, and um, it just didn't. You know, it was just it, it's based on uh, or it's tied to the short film that I I shot last year or a year and a half ago, and so um, really being able to kind of bunker down and, and focus on it and make really good progress on it um feels like i'm i'm getting it i'm lifting a tremendous weight off my shoulders finally um so when i when i come back in 2017 to la like um i can really hit the ground running with um a few big projects and the script done and the new place and it's kyle 2.0 right a boy yikes <laughs> 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 i never watched that show <laughs> ABC Family, the former Freeform network. I yeah, think that's what yeah. it's now, Freeform. But that's excellent, man. Too goddamn funny. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't see the the next uh, short movie that you made. So uh, yeah, tell yeah. Me, tell me about that if you would. Sure. Well, I'll uh, I'll send you a link. Um, it's called The Shadow Hours, and okay. um, it's essentially it's a proof of concept for a feature. Uh, and like. Two years ago, um, I went through a different breakup and decided, you know what, I'm going to be 30 in six months. Like, I really want to be directing. I haven't shot anything big since the league. Yeah. I've been focusing on I've been focusing on comics, which I love. Sure, but I really want to be shooting. I'm going to make this happen. And uh, I put together this uh, like 18 minute short. Um, about two identical twins with this condition where only one can be awake at a time. So uh, they pose as one person. Each one is only awake for basically half half of each day. Um, and they leave like audio recordings for each other so that the other one always knows what they supposedly did. Um, and they work as a private investigator, uh, but the one, the one wants out. And the only way to really get out would be if the other one died and there's kind of a secret relationship that's budding on the side for them and so it gets messy and complicated um it's kind of a uh one of my one of my friends when they saw it described it as like a, a like a gattaca crossed with memento uh <laughs> short and okay. i t- i said i will completely take that hell yeah um <laughs> so uh so yeah so it's it's a like i said it's, it's a proof of concept for a feature and it's uh it's been a complicated feature to write um because to really do it right you want to play with uh, point of view and perspective and you want to be as disoriented as one of the twins is when they wake up and they don't know what has happened for the previous, you know, 12 Ooh. hours. Yeah. But great. you, yeah, but you also want to follow the other twin. So it's picking your moments, you know? Sure. Um, anyway, so it's, it's, a, it's been a tricky one, but uh, we finished it in January of last year. Uh, or no, of, th- of this year. And, um, we held a uh, we held a big screening for it in February, uh, and then uh, there's a website for it now, theshadowhours.com. It's got uh, it's got a, some clips up. It's got um, some social media stuff. Although I haven't updated it in, in quite a while because I've been r- kind of running around, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been in, it's it's in festivals right now. We're waiting to hear back from a, another probably like 15 or 20 festivals. But um, it played at the at Holly Shorts in L.A. and then okay. It, it, it just played at a festival in San Francisco called Another Hole in the Head, and it actually won uh, Best Thriller at that festival. Fantastic, which was, man! Which is pretty fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. So, um, so yeah, so I've got about uh, I kind of I just hit the midpoint of the of the screenplay. I'm up through you know page sixty somewhere in there, and um, I should have a draft done uh, by uh, by Christmas. By the end of the year is 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 the game plan. Attaboy. So. Now, yeah, I, yeah. I am always, uh, I you know, I, I love masks, and I think, uh, you know, everything in the league and everything that you've been doing, or Kyle, excuse me, not masks, it was Kyle. Mm-hmm. And Kyle, the, yeah. You know, and yeah, the league, the, the short film that, that inspired Kyle and everything. And uh, no, you're, you're you're a great concept guy. Same goes with Hadrian's Wall. And uh, Oh, thanks, man. Absolutely. And, well, this one, this yeah. one in particular was, was a lot of fun because uh, it's the first time I've shot something where I felt like... I was a the, the I felt the writing was was strong, um, definitely stronger than anything I've ever directed before. Um, just by the simple fact that I've had a, a lot of practice over the last couple of years. You know, comics yeah. has been an amazing um, kind of uh, train. Not I don't want to say training ground, 
um, but it's been a, a, an amazing proving ground for me. And I'm, I write a lot, you know, so just naturally, even if you're a shitty writer, um, <laughs> if you write, if you write a lot over five, six years, you're, you're going to get better. <laughs> you may still be shitty, but you'll be less shitty, right? Well, who so, else, who, um, who do you bounce things off of? I mean, you, you've got Alex, obviously, as a writing partner, but or, Alec or Alex? Uh, Alec. Alec, or yeah. Alec, excuse me, because I don't want to – sorry, Alec, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> but no, you know, honestly, uh, who – who? and I know Bucolato is, uh, is another – Brian Bucolato, uh, for people yeah. who don't recognize the last name right away, uh, is, is a good writing buddy of yours as well. Um, yeah, um, well, th- those two are, are yeah, they're, they're not only great writers, but they're two of my best friends. Um, Alec, uh, for those who, who don't know, Alec co-writes um, some uh, some stuff with me. Like we've we've co-written we co-wrote a screenplay together. That's kind of our writing sample around town. Um, it, it's an adaptation of Dwayne Swierzynski's The Wheelman uh, that we did a couple years ago. I didn't realize and then, you did uh, a, a treatment of uh, the wheel, man. That's fantastic. I finally, yeah, read it's, I love it's a that really, book. I do too. It's a really fun script. And we had originally developed the, um, the script in conjunction with these, um, these producers, uh, that optioned the book for us from Dwayne and then it didn't work out, but we still have the rights to the script. Uh, but we don't have the rights to the book anymore. Dwayne re-optioned it, uh, okay. to a production company. And so, I, I'm actually not sure if they're moving forward on it or what's going on. Um, he and I chat every once in a while, and I, I'm always asking him, like, "So is, is are, are the are the rights uh, are the rights still tied up?" Because <laughs> um, we've been using the script as a writing sample, and uh, not only has it it been a really good sample for us, because um, we went in and we then rewrote it probably about a year ago, um, but uh, a lot of places then ask, like, "Well, what's going on with this?" Because they you know, are, are interested in, in the, um, not only the script, but, uh, as a writing sample, but as a, as a potential, like, you know, could, could we do this sort of thing? Um, and then, uh, but we've, we've written, uh, some comics together as well. And Cowell, uh, and Hadrian's Wall are both books that we Mm co-write together. Mm -hmm. Um, and then Brian Bucciolato, uh, is also, um, not only is he a comics writer, uh, but he's a screenwriter, and he just uh, he just won the um, the Universal uh, Fellowship uh, this year. So he's actually tied up for the next uh, I think it's probably eight months at this point, um, and he is working on some scripts for Universal as as a, like I said as a part of the fellowship program. That's fantastic! It, it's person. great. Yeah, it's it's he's super super talented. He's a, not only is he a great screenwriter, um, but he's a he's a really good director as well. Um, and you know, he's done. I saw, some- yeah, I saw his short movie that I know what came from his, uh, creator of book. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, that's okay. Son- Sons of the demon. Sons of the devil. Yeah. You Sons know, of the devil. Yes. You know, what's funny is I actually did all the post production on that. Well, you know, Kyle, I seem to remember that. And that's another reason why I brought it up because <laughs> I yeah, didn't know, uh, honestly, man, that turned out great. And, and, and that's, you know, go on. Yeah. Well, and that's, that was the, the project that really got me thinking and wanting to shoot again. Um, cause I, I helped Brian put it together. And then when we got to post, I didn't have time to edit it, but I did, um, I did like all the color work on it. I did all the sound editing and then all of the mixing. And then I brought in, uh, Christopher Carter, uh, to do the score and just, you know, going back to kind of my roots in, in post-production and it was kind of like being in film school all over again. Like it was great. Sure. And it's such different muscles from comics writing. Uh, it, but it really kind of reinvigorated me and made me go, Oh, I really want to do this again for my own stuff. Terrific. And, and so then I think I literally like a month later, like, you know, went through, like I said, I went through breakup and was like, well, I've got time now. And, <laughs> and I exactly. really want to, yes. I really want to kind of, find something to focus on and so i'm gonna do that but um but yeah so brian and then um his his girlfriend uh jen young is in the ucla producers program right now and um she's doing a book with brian at image uh called cannibal it's great um yes. and then um my other uh really really good friend uh doesn't write comics but his name is justin Paisecki. he and i went to the university of iowa together freshman and sophomore year and became really good friends and then when I transferred out, we both got turned down by USC. Uh, I got into Chapman in Southern California. He got into NYU. So we went to opposite coasts. And then like a, like two years ago, 
he and uh, his now wife uh, moved out to L.A., and he just won the Nichols Fellowship. Wow. So he's doing really, really well, and he's one of the best writers, uh, one of the best writers I know through and through. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then the, the other person I'd, I'd probably mention is uh, another very good friend of mine, Ryan Parrott, who uh, actually worked on Gates of Gotham, some later issues with me because I needed some help um, just oh, from wow. deadlines. But he, um, he was a writer's assistant on Revolution, and he's on another show right now that I'm blanking on. But probably the best just uh, raw, like true writer that, that I know has, has more good ideas in a morning than I do in years. Um, cool. He's just a just really, really talented guy and doesn't mince words. If he does listen to this, he'll laugh because uh, you know when he likes something because he really likes it. Uh, he doesn't, <laughs> but you also know when he doesn't like something. Um, and, That's good. Uh, yeah. That's what you need, man. No, you need, you need a good, you know, dissenting voice that you trust and make you even just take a step back and go, all right, is, you know, is there validity in this? Do I like, you know, do I agree? And, and, or, you know, and, and that's fine. You know, again, yeah, someone that could be honest enough with you to go relook this over. Cause I'm not getting it. Yeah, you exactly. Know, and, and we all, we all read each other's stuff. Um, and it's just a really good kind of supportive little group that we have sure. in, in LA. And then like my, I lived with Alec for like eight years um, and our other roommate is a cinematographer who shot, uh, the shadow hours, uh, for me as well. So like, it was like this whole oh, little, great. yeah, it's like this little collective that we have. Like it's, um, it's, it's really nice. Like it's, uh, I, I feel very lucky to have, you know, really, uh, really great, not only friends, but, um, creative kind of, uh, partners and, and inspiration, uh, sure. in, you know, involved so heavily in my life. Has the leap in technology been enough? Because, you know, you're younger than me, and I always kind of look back as when I left school mm-hmm. and what I could what I could do on my own when I left school compared to what I can do now is infinite. I mean, you know, and I, I, I made that point during Thanksgiving uh, meals and stuff and said, God, you know, when I get out of college, if I can make – if I can raise five grand, maybe I can build a home studio and really, you know, start doing stuff. And this is well before – the laptop and really just the whole internet and uh, you know uh, apps and 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 the advances in audio technology that right. make things a lot simpler even doing this very podcast right um you know so and granted again you're younger is has the leap from when you were in school to where we are now is it still like jesus it's so much easier to do these kind of projects with my friends than it would have been in school. No, no, I wouldn't okay. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> okay. I would no, say No, that's good to know. All right, go on. I, I would say in certain ways, yes. Um, you know, how to, you know, the technology, um, as far as like, you know, cameras being able to capture a high quality image, um, as well as finishing just the post-production kind of pipeline and the workflow is definitely easier, but the true, like the reality is to, to make something look good, it costs money. It that's just that's sure. never it that's always the case. Okay. And okay. from a production standpoint, especially the way that I that I like to shoot, and that's part of why I didn't shoot anything after the league for for so long is that, you know, the league was a, a fairly high budget, but for a student film, um, you know, th- to pull those resources together and a crew of, you know, twenty or thirty people and and. Um, you know, lighting and locations and permits and the whole nine yards, like it's, it requires a lot of manpower and a lot of, um, uh, and a lot of, and and a significant amount of money, um, on, on the shadow hours, uh, you know, I'm was incredibly fortunate to work with, um, another good friend of mine, uh, Omar Spahi, who, uh, executive produced the film and, and really made it, uh, possible, um, and then uh, he actually uh, he does um, he does he kind of produces uh, Hadrian's Wall as well uh, okay. and Sons of the Devil. Um, so he's kind of you know he's he's a friend oh, of ours I and he's gotten produced. involved. Yes. What's his What's his comic imprint name again? Uh, well, the imprint does he is. Still have it or no? He does. It's uh, uh, O S S M Comics. Yeah, which, yeah. Which stands for Omar Spahi Santa Monica, 
but he says it's awesome, like awesome comics. Okay. Um, which <laughs> amuses us or amuses sure. me anyway. Um, but uh, but he's a, he's a great guy, and he has uh, he has really good taste on stuff like this. And and the cool thing is like he trusts the people that he gets involved with. So like on Shadow Hours, he just wanted to enable. He was so supportive and, and wanted to enable me to be able to carry out kind of the vision I had for the project. And same with Hadrian's Wall. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he brought some, you know, upfront capital on Hadrian's Wall for, uh, for Alec and myself and Rod, um, you know, because we announced the book in July and it didn't come out for like a year later because we needed to get a couple issues in the can. Sure. And, um, yeah, so... Uh, so, so that <clears throat> I totally lost my train of thought. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, no, you're answering my question in terms of no, you need the money. Yeah, to obviously, uh, make something look great and and really, like you and said, it, produ- from a producing and also obviously to, to you know, like you said, cast, crew, locations, everything you yeah, need to really and, and it depends, facilitate a film. It depends on the project, obviously. Like if you've got sure. uh, if you've got a little conversation piece or you've got something with snappy dialogue or a comedy, like you don't have to go. You don't have to go, you know, and blow it out, right? Right. Um, right. I tend to shoot with a lot of. Um, I tend to shoot with a lot of kind of uh, very deliberate camera moves, like a lot of uh, a lot of dolly shots, and uh, part of that is they're they're tough to pull off. So from a, from a directing standpoint, trying to you know kind of separate yourself in the age of you know camera phones and camera phone footage and. Uh, you know, even TV, well, it's in HD, so you just throw it on, throw the camera on, on your shoulder and it'll still look good. Right. And it's all like the rip and run style, the kind of very deliberate, you know, precision based camera moves are tough to pull off, but they also separate you because not a lot of people are doing them. Right. But I, I, yeah, yeah. I kind of lucked out cause that's also the style I really like. It's very kind of David Fincher. Um, like I said, very kind of precision based, uh, um, storytelling, I'll and yeah. like I said, that stuff's that stuff's tough to pull off because there there is expensive gear required to do it and to do it right, you know. Sure. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah. So this one, um, like I said, there's there's a clip on on the website if if anyone is interested in checking it out. It, it stars uh, Tom Riley from uh, Da Vinci's Demons and um, Britt Lauer from Man Seeking Woman. Um, Lauren Lester's in it. Uh, Towards the end, he's the. For those who don't know, he's the voice of uh, Dick Grayson on uh, Batman: uh, The Animated Series. Uh, <laughs> so that was uh, that was pretty awesome for me to finally get to work with him. And then oh, uh, it's got That's a pretty great. pretty killer score from uh, from my buddy uh, Bear McCreary. That's excellent, man. So it's theshadowhours.com. Theshadowhours.com, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, and if I I don't know if I'm able to embed a, a video on warballoon.com, but I'd rather send people to your site anyway. Either yeah, way. yeah. To- I mean, either way. Um, okay, good. Yeah, excellent. No, man, that's terrific, and I'm I'm glad to hear that. And no, you got you got a great you know you got a great ear and you got a great eye, man. So I'm glad to hear that uh, those muscles are working again in terms of uh, film work as well as the comic book work. So let's get into Hadrian's Wall because Omar is executive producing this as well. Um, yeah. Are you, are you four issues in? We uh, issue three is out. Four went to the printer a week or two ago, so okay. it'll it'll be out in the next uh, you know week or two. All right. Well, give people the elevator pitch. I am a sucker for anything that happens in space, <laughs> and uh, I am. I love dude uh, astronaut. You know, not, and forgive me, Larry Young, astronauts in trouble. I'm always you know that you you, you had me at hello. So sure, uh, <laughs> sure. Well, it's um. It, it's a it's kind of an interstellar uh, noir, right? Like yep. it's a, it's a murder mystery on a spaceship. That's kind of the the, the best way, kind of quote unquote high concept way to describe yeah. it. Um, in a lot of ways, it's uh, it's our love letter to like seventies and eighties sci fi films, stuff like uh, Blade Runner and Alien, Aliens, Outland, uh, The Abyss. Um, it's it's a concept that I I'd had for for a long time about doing like a locked room murder mystery on a spaceship um where it's you know a nine person crew and one of them dies and and you don't know who did it uh it it was really a concept that i'd been thinking could make a really tight little screenplay that i could 
try to go direct as a feature for not a lot of money because it's all just one set, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but uh, I never had anything more than that. I didn't have any the, any any really kind of interesting or compelling character story. Like I, I just it was just a concept. And when we were wrapping up Cowl, um, we were looking for something else to do. And we wanted to do we wanted to do something that was contained. Um, just based on the nature of Cowl and, and the attrition rate on comics and as a, as a newer creative team, um, we felt like the key for us was to build a track record of really cool, interesting books uh, rather than try to do our big Walking Dead or Chew, right? The, the massive run, which is mm -hmm. so hard to actually do in the modern marketplace to begin with. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so with this was a concept that kind of kept popping back up in my mind, and um, just in talking with uh, with Rod and Alec about it, um, you know, I started writing it uh, a, a couple months after, probably like five months after the the, the first uh, breakup, and the idea of like navigating the aftermath of of something like that where, you know, you do see the person and, and, uh, things are different, you know, like that's always been fascinating to me. It, it's, it's my favorite element of the abyss as well. And, um, I just started thinking about that, thinking about it in, in those terms where if, if a crew member dies and they're married to another crew member, and then the investigator coming out is actually that woman, um, if, sorry, let me, let me try that again. If, if, if a crew member dies and he's married to um, another crew member, and, you know, she's still on the ship, and then it's her ex-husband who comes out to investigate, there's all sorts of interesting kind of dynamics there. And it really got me kind of questioning, you know, what these, what these people's um, stories were and A, how did the first marriage fall apart? And B, how did these two then end up on this ship? And C you know, can this investigator stay, uh, above all of, you know, there's massive conflict of interest there. Right. But sure. can he look at it objectively and while also trying to navigate his own failed marriage and all the feelings that kind of come with that. And then taking that one step further, you know, we talk about kind of, uh, I, our love of like seventies and eighties sci-fi films. And there are a lot of sci-fi books on the stands right now, but um, aesthetically, we really wanted to do something different, and we just started thinking, like, well, what if we actually do this more like an 80s film? Uh, and the idea of Rod kind of painting uh, the book um, in that in that vibe was really, really intriguing to us. And then I think, it, you know, Alec brought in the element of the backdrop to all this being, you know, an interstellar Cold War between Earth and its first, or its biggest colony on, on Theta. And so that coupled with Simon and Annabelle's um, relationship, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're the exes. Simon's the investigator, Annabelle is the, uh, the bereaved. Um, it becomes this kind of, it, it became this kind of exploration of broken relationships, right? Okay. And um, that, you know, we wrote, we did like the first kind of four issues. Um, and uh, I, the funny thing is I started doing press uh, for issue one, and uh, we were we were working on issues five through eight, but uh, you know we had a lot of lead time, and so I was you know I really needed to kind of I hadn't kind of looked at it in a in a in a couple months from a script standpoint, and then I I was like oh man I really got to finish this last these last like you know two issues I I don't know it's interesting I'm really not in that headspace anymore you know like I'm in a good kind of relationship I'm you know happy and then. Good. The, boom. The universe has a way like a week later. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, excuse me. It, of course, this is before this was all resulting from the first breakup. Yeah. And now yeah. you're in the midst of the second. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I, dude. <laughs> so I started the book after one breakup, worked through it and through the midpoint of the book and, and beyond. And then all of a when? sudden went through uh, a second breakup that was very different from the first. Uh and literally am going through that breakup as we're sending issue one to the printer. So if you read the letters column at the end of issue one, it's very relevant. <laughs> wow. It was like, it was like day five or six that I wrote the letters column. Okay. Uh, after going Christ. through this and kind of 
you know, out of, feeling kind of like is out of nowhere and then dealing with having to move out and all of that stuff that all of that fun, messy stuff that, uh, messy life stuff. Right. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, well, I, I told you about my messy life stuff that I'm going through and everything. Yeah. Else, so. And uh, yeah, I'm no, sorry, man. man. Hey, it's, that's, hey, I'm with you. No, no, but the, cr- the, the crazy, ahead. the crazy thing about it is that all of a sudden, and I remember thinking this at the time, well, this book just got a lot more relevant in my life. <laughs> Yeah, but and dude, I didn't know. Um, you know, uh, Dave Hyde and uh, his his PR people sent me the first four issues, but it's strictly the story. I didn't get any of the back matter. So. Uh, oh, 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 oh! Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, so yeah, man, I've 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 been yeah. I just read the story, so no, I didn't realize that. Uh, all right, well, there's another reason to go and grab the issues right now. <laughs> well, uh, and and you know, I'm not someone who I'm not good at compartmentalizing, and I'm not good at taking like, like if there's something bad going on and i said this in, in the issue four letter column letters column if there's something bad going on in my life i'm not really good at uh, i'm getting better at this but I'm, I, I haven't in the past been very good at just setting it aside and focusing on work right okay and i'm definitely not good at taking that life event or experience and channeling it into the work like it's too raw you know Sure. But in this case, um, it was a rare instance where, like, literally the first issue is going to the printer, and I'm working on, you know, the last, because it's only an eight-issue series, so I was only, I was working on, okay. like, issues, you know, kind of six through eight. And, um, and it's like, I don't have a choice. Like, I have to. I have to work on this. Like, sure. this book sure. is happening. And so I found ways to really kind of channel what was going on and how I was feeling and... And the diff- kind of the whole experience of it, and and the pain, and the loss, and um, the anger, and just all of it. And I found it informing the story in a way that I was not anticipating or expecting. Um, and uh, it, I don't know if it was cathartic or not, but I think it may it has made uh, for a really uh, interesting uh, story, in my opinion, anyway. Um, no, I hear you, man. Well, and then I would imagine deeper characterization too. Yeah, you know, for the for the two for the two X's and everything. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's no, that's awesome, man. And I, well, and again, I'm sorry that the heartache had to help contribute. To that. <laughs> I'm not. I'm but, not really uh, someone who believes like in the whole like. Well, an artist has to suffer in order to make good art. Um, but uh, but in this case, like, it just kind of happened that way. <laughs> No, I hear you, man. You know, honestly, and as we, again, go through life's troubles and stuff, I think it's more, and yeah, that was always the stock comment that an artist has to suffer. Basically, you know, life is up and down. Yeah. And, I mean, it's like an EKG. And and you just kind of, I think the artist is able to interpret and and possibly, you know, use some of that that experience and, and channel it through their work, possibly. Right. Um, and that's the thing, or, or understand it and... and use it for their work in a different way than a, than an average person would just be, you know, just getting through it as best as they can. And as you say, I mean, they have to do the same things. Everyone has to either car, car, uh, compartmentalize the problems or, or you know, find and find a way to work through it. And everything. Yeah, the, the, Your work happens to be more narrative <laughs> yeah. rather than, you know, rather than going and, you know, making the donuts every day. Well, so, yeah, you know. and, and, it, and when you're going through something and trying to write a story that, it is definitely thematically similar. Like the the key is to not like it's a fine line, right? Like you don't want to just you don't want to transcribe your life into the narrative fiction. Sure. And and luckily, you know that's you know Alec Alec you know co-writes this with me, and so <laughs> def, you know he'll if I go too far, he'll pull it back. And just our narrative sense, okay. my natural narrative sense is definitely more. Uh, it, it's it's more. Um, uh, I don't know quite how to how to say it. Um, it's more, you know, uh, um, dr- I don't want, I guess, dramatic than than my life is. So so it sure. tends to, you know, you find reality a lot of times is is, is boring, um, and so it's finding those moments where, it, it, but reality can be very very raw, um, and so you try to balance, or I try to balance anyway, bringing some of that rawness while still making it narratively compelling, you know, uh, and dramatic. Okay. Um, and, uh, usually I, 
if I'm pulling kind of from my own life or events or whatever, like I need time and space after whatever, you know, has happened just to be able to kind of process it. Um, and in this case, you know, I was writing a lot, um, while I was going through it. And so then have rewritten kind of after the fact and and things. And I've just never, I've never worked that way before. Um, so it was interesting. Um, you know, I, hopefully I won't, uh, hopefully I won't have to do it again. I hear you, man. Well, so you did rewrite, did you rewrite certain parts of the issues and everything kind of? Yeah. I mean, I'm still working on them. Cause like I said, four just went to the printer. We're taking, um, right. Rod, Rod's doing a pretty killer, uh, one shot for Marvel, uh, a civil war aftermath, uh, thing right now that he's, he's illustrating. Oh, that's yeah. Great. So we, um, and it kind of kept slipping in the schedule. So we we basically took two months off uh, after issue four. So issue four will be out this month, and then there won't be an issue in uh, January or February. But then five through eight will come out uh, in March, from you know March, March, April, May, June. Okay. Are you collecting it in two trades, or are you going to do one eight? One eight it's going to be one trade? eight issue trade. We we talked to, we talked okay. to to Eric uh, Stevenson about that quite a bit actually because we were trying to figure out like it's it's an eight issue series. Is it weird? Like, we could do two trades because we have back matter and, you know, we could do two four issue trades. But since it's only an eight issue series and it's not going to really go beyond that, we ultimately kind of all just decided it felt weird to do it like that. So it would be better just to do. I hear. Yeah, you. better to just do the one trade. I hear you, man. No, I think that's that's OK. Well, and do you see yourself obviously beyond Hadrian's Wall? Like, do you, Alec and Rod, think, like you said, I mean, is it the three of you in terms of, oh, let's keep doing, you know, other concepts and stuff? I don't know. I mean, uh, in one form or another, um, you know, Rod's got a pretty uh, pretty great opportunity right now at Marvel. And, and sure. you know, he's only really, besides this this one shot he's doing at Marvel, he's only written from scripts that, that I've written. Yeah. Yeah, Cowlin. Yeah, Cowlin. Yeah, Marianne's so... Well. No, honestly, I haven't at all talked. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say. So, I mean, I I think if there's, you know, some there, um, if there's some possibilities there for Rod, like, you know, it would be silly for me to say, like, don't explore those. Right. Um, And on the flip side, um, I'm pretty at this moment in time, I'm like my dance card is pretty full as far as creator own projects and now work for hire stuff going into 2017. So, um, some of them are, are, are short. Some of them are just minis, but I need to like, I need to burn through them before I can even kind okay. of consider like, okay, well what's next, you know? I hear you. Okay. You know, uh, Rod's art. And I mean, really it started with Cowell and also, uh, just some great online, uh, portraits that he was doing of like great old time, Mike Hollywood. Oh yeah. Cowell. You know, I mean, I, you, you, you know, a lot of us only knew Rod as a colorist and then really because of Cowell and, and that stuff, you know, we really discovered our, uh, Rod's art and man, he is, he really is so unique and great. And I love the marriage of his color choices for Hadrian's wall, plus his natural his, ability. His I mean, stuff on, his stuff amazing. on Cowell was great. The stuff he's doing on Hadrian's oh, yeah. wall blows the doors off that. Like, yeah, he's, he's really gone up another the level. The fact Absolutely. that. The fact that he is not kind of a, a better known, uh, you know, name in in the in the in- industry as an illustrator is is frustrating to me. Um, I don't know who uh, I don't quite know how you know Eisner nominations and stuff like that work. Uh, I've asked Image about that a little because Rod should be up for something like he really should and yeah. best newcomer, yeah. best painter, something. I mean, he's the jump that he made from Kyle to Hadrian's wall, um, you know, the book, the, the book kind of similar, similar to Cowell has kind of flown under the radar. Um, you know, the first issue we, we had a, a really nice campaign, uh, launch campaign for, uh, put together by David Hyde and, and Kat at image. Um, and we did a ton of press for it and we had the four issues done before the first issue even came out. So we were, um, we had those in hands of retailers and reviewers and everything else. But, you know, since then it's kind of, um, and, and maybe it's the nature of it being a mini series as well. And, and it's a crowded marketplace, you know, um, it, 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 sure, it exactly. very much feels like it kind of flies under the radar and I mean, that's fine. Like we're just doing the book because we want to tell this story. Um, 
but it it does frustrate me to think like Rod is doing the work of his career, and uh, I'm I'm just excited for more people to discover it. I hear you, man. Yeah, I it's no, it's it's great. It's the, his choices of when you're planet side and when you're in the spaceship are are really I think distinct and and really fit every scene. And he's just no, he's a, he's a real artist that is waiting exactly to be discovered. Totally. And uh, and it'll be the right you know the right project will happen. Well, you know, man, honestly, no no matter what happens with these sales and stuff, and I you know I keep having this conversation. I just talked about this with Ryan Brown. Um, the great thing is, man, you know, you're both of you will have this stuff on your table. If if something else is the one that kind of makes the audience stand up and say, oh, these guys are amazing, you're going to have a stack of other trades of of other concepts and stuff that you can also sell. I think these are all oh, going to be for sure. And the cow's going to be. A I, I mean, you know, what's, I mean, what was what's so. what's Bendis's saying? Like Powers became more popular like ten years after he wrote it, or after it came out, or something like sure. that. Sure. Well, and well, and also Powers and Ultimate Spider-Man suddenly allowed all of his caliber work to be yeah, discovered. Yeah. You know, Goldfish and Jinx and, and and Fire and all those things. And yeah, Remender, it's the same thing for Rick, and uh, you know that's the thing. And I mean. Doing this for 12 years now, I mean, that's kind of what I've been noticing uh, coming on 12 years. And, and yeah, it's been fun to watch. And then all of a sudden, everyone reaches back and, you know, it rediscovers your old stuff. Yeah. And, yeah, I think that I think. Well, I think they're I, the long, you know. It's yeah. The and game. there's definitely an element of, you know, I do think there's an aspect of needing to kind of keep your foot in the in the work for hire kind of pool as well a bit. Um, sure. If you're able to. and. You know, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. I, I you know, I'm, I'm also writing Power Rangers, and uh, yeah, I want to talk. I obviously want to talk about. Power yeah, Rangers. and that's that's a case where like, <laughs> it's really interesting because it's a basically a big team superhero book at an indie publisher, um, and sure. it's a blast. Sure. Like, the things that I'm getting to do, um, both on the character side, but also on the narrative side. Uh, is so much fun and to have the full support of boom and, and Saban is like is great and it's such a different kind of fan base uh, from well that what I'm used yeah, to man, yeah honestly I want to get into I want to get into all of that because I I kind of had the same discussion with, with Charles Soul recently and it's on an older property the Inhumans yeah. but I just never was an Inhumans guy so I'm like all right Help me out. I mean, I, I knew the basics, and I certainly loved the classic runs in FF and stuff. And he really, like, by the, took me by the hand. It's like, okay, this is what I'm doing. So I'm going to ask you about Power Rangers because, again, generationally, you know, I was I was too busy getting late to watch <laughs> Power Rangers when, I, when, it was, <laughs> when it was out 25 years. Yeah, I was eight, so, that so doesn't, I can't and, even make well, that joke. Well, there you go, man. Exactly. And, I, and no, and honestly, I, I did appreciate it from an action standpoint. I know that it was... Uh, you know, a Japanese concept that came here, and they obviously translated stories and uh, you know used used footage, I guess, from the original series maybe initially, and then had new. Uh, oh, they American, s- they uh, still scenes. do that. Oh, okay, there you go. Well, th- okay, so yeah, so is it like the Toho of superheroes, basically, where you know, I mean, it, it, I mean, and really, God, you know, Japanese uh, television and film and everything is a long tradition of uh, superheroes and monsters. And yeah, it's, but, it, it was a show. I mean, it is a show uh, in Japan called it's the Super Sentai series. And okay. um, the, I don't fully know the history other than because there were a couple different permutations of this, but Ham Saban had the rights to uh, this Super Sentai footage. And he put together uh, basically a pitch, and I think it was original. Like the first pitch was called, called Galactic Rangers, I think. Um, okay. And that didn't okay. go, but Power Rangers uh, was basically w- what you're saying. Like it was uh, Super Sentai footage of the, I think it's the Zeringer season. Um, actually, I know it's the Zeringer season. Uh, and all of the action footage was then combined with new uh, storylines. It was basically repurposed uh, with yeah. American actors yeah. in all of the non-costume sequences. And so all the giant monster battles. Basically, everyone listening to this probably knows this much, at least, <laughs> about Power Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, and I admit, I'm the, I'm the one that's benefiting. No, so I got those basics. All right, well, then let's, let's leap forward to 
Boom gets the license. Right, right. They come to you, and yeah, like how much, how much backstory, and you don't even have to go into right. detail. But you know, yeah, how much backstory are you working with, and how much new stuff? Because obviously, <clears throat> I know issue nine was a big game changer for the franchise. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, so get me up. To okay, issue nine. so basically, what <laughs> happened was. Um, well, first of all, I should say too, like for those who don't know, Power Rangers is still running. It's like it's on it's it's twenty fourth season right now, and they that's amazing. yeah, that's and they have huge viewer viewer numbers like and this huge fan base, and it's it's a it's a whole thing. Yeah, and um, yeah, I see it at the conventions. I mean, that's why I'm like, okay, the Red Power Rangers yeah. is here, and then I see his line and go, that's why the Red Power yeah, Rangers exactly. is here. Fantastic. So, um, you know, I, I was a fan when I was like eight. Uh, okay. I was on the tail end cause it started in, uh, I think it was either, I think it was 93 and, um, okay. I was on the tail end, like I was on the, uh, the high end of the age range. So at school it was super popular in third grade, but then by the time we hit fourth grade, uh, it was super unpopular. Um, and like the younger kids were still into it but like i was like literally at the tail end of it so so i was okay. super into it for like the first year the first season uh which was like 60 some episodes i want to say like it was crazy yeah and um fast forward 20 years something like that no 21 something like that and uh boom gets the license um and I reached out to my friend uh, Bryce Carlson, who who works at Boom, and I said, uh-huh. "Who do I who do I have to kill to write a pitch for Power Rangers? <laughs> Hopefully not you, because you're the only one I know at Boom." Um, and uh, I basically just said, "Well, <laughs> sorry, I'm I'm doing a terrible job of telling the story. Uh, I'm, I'm remembering oh, now. A few years earlier, Bryce and I were talking on like G Chat, and I said, "You know what Boom should do? I think I was just <laughs> starting to write Nightwing." And I was like, you know what Boom should do? Boom should do a Power Rangers book, like an updated Power Rangers book. He's like, hell yeah. He's like, oh, we've talked about that. Bryce is a big Power Rangers fan as well. And Boom is so okay. good at, you know, teenage focused um, books. And I just felt like aesthetically and and um, just everything about it made sense. And then uh, a few months later, Paper Cuts got the license and so okay. I was like, oh, well, I guess that won't happen. Fast forward like four years and Boom is announcing uh, that they're going to do this book. And they put out concept art um, that turned out to be the covers for issue zero that were done by okay. Goni Montes. And they are super hip uh, illustrations of each ranger holding their, their helmet. And I saw those, and I went, "Yes, like that. Is, like aesthetically, that's exactly what I felt like this book should be. Like super hip, okay. uh, modern. Um, it's a team superhero book, right? And so, sure. so yeah. Bryce emailed me back and said, you know, actually, because I assumed they already had a creative team lined up. I was just pitching to like do a backup or something. And he's like, actually, okay. he's like, <laughs> we're looking for a main writer, and your name has definitely come up." Oh, that's great. And so I said, okay. I said, well, uh, this was right around Comic-Con last year uh, in San Diego. And I said, well, look. I said, I'm going to go shoot this little film of mine, The Shadow Hours, um, in early August. But I have, like, a two-week window after San Diego where I could write a pitch. And so that's what I did. And I basically just pitched, here's what I would do. Um, and if this is in the ballpark, cool. If it's not, then I'm not the right guy for the job. And sure. part of that is based on the fact that I wanted to do updated. I wanted to kind of reinvent it a little bit. Uh, I wanted to modernize it. Um, I wanted to dramatize it more. Um, and I also just wanted to kind of bring a little bit. It sounds it sounds tacky to say sophistication to it, but like from a narrative standpoint, like I would advantage of the monthly serialized comic format um, because the show was a lot of one and dones and they're all in 20 minutes sure. and they're limited. Absolutely. And, and Y7 and a Y7. Yes. One and they're, and they're that. limited by 
budget. They're limited by pre-existing footage, you know. So I wanted to Absolutely. open it up and really take advantage of the format that we're working in where we have no budget. We can do anything. And um, so really kind of play with that and show and shine a light on why Power Rangers as a property, as a concept, as a franchise um, has thrived for all this time. Right. And just do it justice, you know? And um, yeah, so I pitched what I wanted to do and basically I wanted to come in. I didn't want to do new origins or anything like that. I wanted to come in uh, with the introduction of the green Ranger to the team. Um, And the reason for that is that power Rangers has always been a property about the power of friendship and teamwork. And so what better way to look at that than through the lens of a new team member. And on the show, the Green Ranger was basically created by Rita, the evil moon witch, who brainwashed um, this kid, Tommy, who's a new kid at school, and just like gave him powers against his will. And then he spent five episodes terrorizing the Rangers and like breaking the command center, like kicking them out of the cockpit on the Megazord. Like it was, it was awesome. And then by the end of the fifth episode, the Rangers break the spell and he just joins the team. And the very next episode, he's just a full member of the team. And I always felt like, well, there's a big story there, you know? And so essentially what I wanted to do was look at the introduction of this guy who in a lot of ways is like the winter soldier, right? Has just gone through some and done some terrible things against his will but he still did them. And now he's trying to become this, this thing and kind of atone for what he did with a group of kids who not only is he still getting to know them because he's new at school, but he is now thrust into their world without really the proper training. And also he may or may not still be hallucinating the evil moon, Witch in his head. So it's like kind of like doing the Manchurian candidate for power Rangers, right? Can they, tr- that's fixed. That's can they fixed. trust him? Can he trust himself? <laughs> Um, it's like the way I described it in the press is like, uh, you know, on paper, every LeBron James basketball team of the last like six years looks like it should just obliterate the league. Right. Like when he first went to Miami and it was Bosch, LeBron James and, um, and, and Dwayne Wade, you thought, well, they're gonna, they're gonna win 70 games this year. And it took like a good half season for them to figure out how to play together and figure out how to gel. And so that's kind of the idea here is looking at that team dynamic uh, and idea um, once it's been flipped. And um, so the first big arc has followed this threat, this this new villain. Uh, the first four issues was Rita carrying out attacks to supercharge a crystal to bring this villain from another somewhere. You don't know. And he shows up at the end of issue four and he's called uh, the Black Dragon. And he just completely hands the Rangers their asses. Destroys the command center, blows it up. Zordon's gone. The robots seemingly destroyed the whole nine yards. The Rangers in issue six have to retreat to like a pocket dimension. Rita then moves into their command center and like basically occupies it as her new base of operations. And like... cool. They have like the foot soldiers are 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 putties, right? The villains are like their kind of army of villains are these gray. I'm sure you've seen them. These gray, you know, creatures that go. Ooh, 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 they're called putties, and they're they're basically okay. made from clay. And I've gone above and beyond. Like that's my favorite thing is on the show. Like they're just actors in jumpsuits, but in the book it's like, well, they're clay. So how can I mutilate them? Like let me find fun, interesting ways to fuck with putties. And so there's this great moment in issue six or seven where Rita's moved into their command center. And all of a sudden you just see these piles of putty stacked on top of each other. And all of a sudden a blowtorch just goes over them and melts them down. And what you realize is that the villains are building new walls of the command center, like rebuilding it. And there's like a line of like putties just waiting to come like sacrifice themselves to like rebuild the walls. (laughs) So, great, so man. the big twist then is uh, at the end of issue eight, because uh, obviously there's been speaking 
talking to why I wanted to do this book in the first place, there's been a lot of tension on the team about Tommy's involvement and he's overcompensating, he's pushing and trying to do things on his own. And it really is kind of like a, a selfish to selfless arc for him. So when the Rangers lose all their powers to this new villain, Tommy ends up giving over his powers to repower the team so that they'll, and they're all in like green versions of their uniforms so that, oh, wow. so that because he realizes that at this point in time, they are better at this job together than he is by himself. And, uh, and so then the twist at the end of issue nine is that this villain, the black dragon has actually been big spoilers here, uh, is actually been a Zord that's person sized from another time, from, from another timeline, another world. We don't know. But in that timeline or world, uh, he's being controlled by uh, an evil ranger who looks to be a combination of the green ranger and uh, a future ranger called the white ranger that in the show was the identity that the green ranger then became. He, he lost all of his green powers and then Zordon gave him, created this whole new power set, the white ranger. And, uh, and so it looks like it's a combination of the two, which should be impossible um, but this is the guy who has been terrorizing the Rangers. And so we're basically introducing a new Power Ranger for the first time in, in the, the Mighty Morphin kind of era, the first time in like 23 years. Um, wow. So it was like a big thing in the press and in the fan base. Like the fan community is is very um, excited about this. And um, so, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Like I've got a huge backstory for this. I've got I've got actually big storyline kind of planned out for the next like year to two years. And, um, it's just a lot of fun. It, it really is. So that's awesome, man. No, that's great. And I, uh, it's interesting to see how, uh, is, and is it Sabian? What's it, what's the name of the, uh, oh, S- original, uh, company? Saban, Saban, excuse me. Okay. So yeah. And I mean, like, how are they going to incorporate any of your ideas into, uh, what they're doing? I mean, are they still generating the show? And yeah, they are, but they're not. Um, every year or two years, um, the show changes to coincide with the um, the change in Japanese footage. So, okay. so it's all kind of connected, but kind of not. Um, and at the same time, the book we've we've kind of gone out of our way to establish ourselves in this twist at the end of issue nine really firmly cements us in this territory of um being our being our own thing like we're not just Good. we're not just telling untold tales from the show like we really are we you. really are our own thing in our own timeline and our own iteration of power rangers so um so i don't know i know saban's is really excited about um the things that i've been proposing and and again this introduction of a new ranger so i wouldn't be surprised if they if they do something with it but i have no idea like i haven't you know, I don't really talk to them. I, I, I deal with Boom and then Boom liaisons sure. with them. Okay, that's cool. No, Boom has been, a, I think, a great franchise uh, care, uh, caretaker yeah. for a lot of different things. And uh, and sounds like, uh, you know, the Power Rangers are getting the same kind of good treatment that the John Carpenter stuff has, the Planet of the Apes stuff has. So uh, I'm glad to hear that. And certainly, again, uh, I you know, I know your strengths as a superhero writer as well. <laughs> so... Oh, for real. And, you know, that's the great thing. I, I think, you know, it sounds like uh, there's that you're able to take their continuity and, and, you know, elevate it and evolve it and now make it its own thing. So that's great. Yeah. And and I, I can't reiterate enough. Like, it's just been like it's been a blast, you know, and I um, I've I've done books that aren't fun and this is not one of those. So um, cool. <laughs> and on top of that, we did I got I did a little six page story in the annual this year. Uh, that Rod illustrated. So oh, fun. it's a really cool, like, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it was a lot of fun. So, and it got, it was Rod drawing huge Power Ranger fights. Like it's, it was a blast. That's great, man. No, that's really cool. You know, I, I've always been a fan of Booms and uh, a lot of their employees are among my favorite comic book people, Mel Kalo and certainly uh, Philip Sablik and Ross himself. You know, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I'm a boom guy. I like, I've always liked boom. So I'm always excited when other friends get to work for them on something that they're really enjoying and that it becomes a really great, uh, property and, and series. So that's great. Nice going. Thanks, man. 
Absolutely, man. Very, very cool. Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm really, seriously, man, I, I'm glad. And it sounds like you're putting uh, good energy into some really exciting ideas for 2017. Is there is there anything else you're currently doing? You said that you've got a lot of stuff that I think is coming next year. I don't know if it's been announced yet, and I, I don't want to miss anything. Yeah, um, nothing um... – there's nothing announced yet. Uh, I'm doing two two work for hire gigs right now um, that uh, that haven't yeah haven't been announced. Uh, one okay. has been okay. kind of in the works for quite a while uh, for about a year, and uh, and the other is um, it just came together. And then I have uh, two other uh, two other creator owned books that haven't been announced yet either. Okay, very cool. Well, that's good. That gives us an excuse to talk uh, the sooner than uh, the couple years it's been since we <laughs> talked about Kyle. Yeah, that sounds good, so. man. And I'll well, I mean, really, it, I'll only be able to do it when I'm in Chicago next. So, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's your rule. <laughs> so that is our that is our conversation rule. Uh, do you have conventions yet lined up for uh, 2017? I don't. No. Um, no. No. That's a that's a that's a tomorrow problem, not a today problem. <laughs> I respect I, uh, that. Right. Yeah, this well, was the first New York that I missed in uh, probably like six or seven years, and part of it was like, you know, I was on my I was on my big kind of Europe trip, and the sure. and the other part of it was like, I just need a break from all of this. Like, I just want to, you know, figure some stuff out for myself and and focus on the work. And uh, understood. Yeah. 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 So, um, but I do want to I do want to hit some shows next year and. Um, you know, they're they're they are still a good you know networking opportunity and a, and a, a great opportunity to meet fans and and the like. And um, I kind of have dialed I dialed back uh, the shows that I went to over the last you know year year and a half. Um, so I think it'd be good to to do some more uh, in 2017. So awesome, man! Very very cool. And now I well, like I said, I hope uh, I hope to see you in a couple weeks at the. Uh at the Christmas party at four, at four star. And, uh, you know, and I'm glad that everything is working out and it sounds like, again, you're putting good energy into, you know, what was a, a bad personal experience, but you're, you're, you're looking ahead and getting everything ready. And God, man, I'm telling you, Hadrian's wall is outstanding. Uh, the uh, halfway point is coming and then uh, another four issues, but really like, uh, go back and, uh, and grab those first three issues because it's a, it's a great sci-fi murder mystery. Uh, and good deep characterization, beautiful art from Rod Rice, and uh, no, I, and I and I appreciate the update on the on Power Rangers. I, like I said, I sensed, you know, I knew your excitement. You told me about it when you got the gig, and you were pretty psyched. And uh, and no, I'm glad that it's working out, and that, that the fans are appreciative of what you're doing as well. That's yeah, fantastic. yeah, very cool. awesome, man. That's Kyle Higgins. I hope you check out some of his great books that are out there now. Time for segment two of Ward Balloon, and I hope you enjoy this conversation with Roger Anderson. Uh, back uh, right before the Cincy Comic Con this year, Roger approached me. He's got this framing business. Uh, he has a lot of experience in the framing business, and uh, he has a new uh, company that he started off to help uh, collectors of pop culture keep their stuff looking cool. And his business is called ECC Frames. They are our sponsor today at uh, Word Balloon, eccframes.com. I would suggest you go over there and check out the merchandise. Also look at uh, the uh, fr uh, front of wordballoon.com, the post for this uh, episode, because I've got uh, some work that Roger did for me on two great, amazing Spider-Man comic strips from the early 2000s. And uh, it was a pleasure. And man, I'm telling you, this is a really nice frame. It, it really is a step above and so much more protective uh, for your uh, pop culture items that are really uh, the things that you want to keep pristine, uh, whether they're valuable just to you or truly valuable on the market. It's a good investment, and it's a reasonable investment as well. So let's talk to Roger Anderson about uh, the fun things we all put in our offices and man caves and uh, our space where we like to display our pop culture stuff. So here's Roger Anderson now on Word Balloon. Very happy to welcome Roger Anderson to Word Balloon. Roger is a pop culture collector and uh, also a business guy, and he's got a great business uh, in terms of framing your favorite collectibles. So we're going to talk about collectibles today and also how uh, Roger can help you preserve these things uh, so that they uh, stay cool and, and mint in mint condition. And also a, a great presentation for you in your man cave or your office, wherever you might put this stuff. Welcome, Roger. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. How's it going? 
going good, man. It's my pleasure to have you on. And uh, let's uh, let's talk about this. You're you're a longtime uh, collector of uh, pop culture memorabilia. Yes, I uh, you know, I love everything from movies, music, comic books, toys. You know, I grew up with all of it. I'm sure, just like you did, and you know, people listening to this. And um, you know, we've got a we've got a custom framing shop, and I kind of wanted to branch out from it this year and do some different things. I uh, I've got some nice comics in my collection that I've had for a long time, and I just kind of got the idea. You know, I I want to frame them, but everything that's really on the market, I didn't really want to use those because either they don't really provide good pr- protection or they just don't really look too impressive to put on a wall. Um, I think I think just as a general frame, maybe for you know a kid's room or something, it's okay. But as far as an adult having a nice piece of artwork to hang on the wall, I wanted to to really be able to capture that and give something out to people to, that uh, can really protect it and display it for what it truly is. So we um, we put a lot of work and, and time into researching the market and seeing what we could do and providing different levels at different sales points. Um, to people, whether they want to spend, you know, 40 bucks or if they want to spend a few hundred, depending on the materials they want to use. And, um, we got started on the comic books earlier this year, around June, um, went into magazines, movie mylars, uh, motion picture lobby cards. And, um, now we're doing some prototypes for NES video games, the cartridge and the box. Um, then we're going to move, move into some of the other video games like uh, Nintendo 64, SNES, Atari. Um, the Nintendo stuff seems to be more collectible than some of the other platforms, so that's what we're going to start with. But um, we're trying to get that out before the holidays, and we're also going into the uh, the military um, genre with some basic shadow boxes that uh, you can buy to display some of your badges and um challenge co- uh, coins and different things that you get from being in the service. I know there's some stuff out there on the market as well that's just not really that great. You know, it's just, it's kind of a cheap frame. So we want to be able to have something that if you've got 20 or 30 years in the service or even, you know, just one term, four years, and you really cherish those items to be able to have a really nice custom frame and um, protective materials inside to really display your items. That's a great idea. You know, I can think back to my father was a World War II vet. And I think of uh, some of his ribbons and, and uh, medals that he got, and that's something that it wouldn't have occurred to me. Another another use too for the shadow boxes might be action figures, right? Yeah, and um, kind of along the lines of what we're doing with the video games, the system that we're using to mount the items inside, it's very easy. You can remove the back, place your item inside. Um, there's there's no damage done to the box, so you don't have to worry about. Um, you know, a lot of people that collect that are really hardcore collectors, some of these are worth thousands of dollars and they don't want to damage the box. So it's um, the way we're doing it, you won't have to worry about any kind of damage to the to the box itself of mounting it. And uh, the same, same idea with the action figures. You know, you've got the cardboard back. And you don't want to adhere it to anything because it would ruin it. So it's it's a it's a light mount, if you will. We're not dry mounting anything, but you can place it inside. You can move it out if you want to change out different games or action figures. Same way with the comic books. Nothing's permanent, so that you can um, switch them out, or you know, if later on if you would want to sell it or whatever, you can just take it out, keep the frame, or sell both. That's cool. Let's. I'm just curious too. What kind of things are in your own collection uh, beyond the comics? I'm interested in like any movie memorabilia and stuff, as you were saying. Um, you know, I've really been big into music over the years, so um, I've got a lot of uh, record awards that are presented to bands and uh, management of bands whenever they sell half a million or a million uh, records. And um, also oh, like I, gold records and things like that. Sure. Gold, platinum, double platinum, et cetera. I've got a lot of that kind of things and in, in, anywhere from old rock to me- heavy metal. Um, it's just the type of music that I've always been into. So I've cool. collected a lot of that. Um, and that's, you know, all those are framed up very, very nice items. And um, as far as uh, movie, I do have some lobby cards I'm a really big fan of the uh, John Carpenter era movies. You know, The Thing, Big Trouble in Little China, (laughs) Escape from New York, um, anything John Carpenter related I'm a huge fan of. Um, Even your old, like, uh, Phantasm, you know, like the late 70s through 80s horror movies. I don't know. I think I think the newer horror movies kind of lose the point. They just go for a you know the shock value of the gore, and that I don't. I think it loses its point. And 
with the older movies, you know, they didn't have that. So they they, they had to have a better storyline. Your mm-hmm. the acting had to be better. And one of the things I like about John Carpenter a lot is that he has uh, the elements that he puts into the score for the movie. Right? Absolutely. He does, yeah. does all of it himself, and he he was actually touring here lately. I didn't get a chance to see him. I'm hoping he does it again because, you know, I mean, he is getting a little older. I don't know how how much more um, music he's going to be doing, but. The, the opportunity to get to see him live would really be a big deal for me, so hopefully he'll do it again. But I don't know. I just think that you know, you're know you not relying just on the graphics or anything. You're relying on a good storyline, something that, like I said, the score that he puts to the movie really adds another depth and element to it You know, with all the synths and everything. And um, So I do have some lobby cards and posters, different things from some of those um, movies. And um, you know, we get into some of the comics. Uh, I've got a lot of uh, those in my personal collection, late 80s through 90s stuff. But I've also, I like a lot of the Bronze Age, you know, like Doctor Strange, Howard the Duck cool. uh, type type stuff. And I'm a really big fan of your uh, EC comics, Tales from the Crypt, Vault of Horror, et cetera. I've got um, a good bit of that. I've got a really nice um, Tales from the Crypt book that was autographed by um, Ray Bradbury. And actually, I'd sent it off to get graded uh, by CBCS. Hopefully I'll get that back here in the next couple weeks. It's just when it's supposed to be arriving anyway. That's fantastic that you got that wonderful work. I, I was just rereading uh, his interactions with EC because they initially were kind of stealing his stories, and he very diplomatically sent him a letter going, ah, I didn't get my royalty check on those uh, adaptations <laughs> of my short stories. I'm sure uh-huh. it's an oversight. Looking forward to getting my 50 bucks or whatever it was. And sure. William Gaines obviously is like, okay, no problem. And he sent him the money, and they uh, they established this great rapport, and then they started to do authorized uh, Bradbury adaptations. It was pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, the the guy did a great job, you know. And and I the the thing, the older comic books, which I love all comics, the newer ones, the older ones, but I, I just think those EC comics were ahead of their time, you know. They oh yeah. Uh, the the artwork's great. You can't ask for better artwork. The um, the storylines it's it's got a really in depth story. There's a lot, definitely a lot of um, <coughs> excuse me, um, a lot of pages in each one. The the stories are great. I just you know you can't say enough about them. And as far as them being ahead of the time, it's you know they kind of got pushed out because there wasn't a code back, back at that point. Yep. And um, obviously the subject matter on a lot of it definitely wasn't for kids. But back then, you know, who the hell cares, right? Well, <laughs> and but then, also, also there were, you know, GIs that read comics. And, you know, sure. they, you know that's the thing that, like, comics were enjoyed by adults. And there's some really good uh, stories from that period, that pre-Wortham uh, and Comics Code period, where, yeah, they, they kind of stretched the, the boundaries as far as kids go. But, again, it was a bigger all-ages audience. I mean, certainly the comic strips never were looked down on, and they were more sophisticated uh, aud- you know, adult stories. And there were a lot of comic books that were trying to do the same thing in extreme genres like horror, or but also romance and crime. And, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, that's the thing. And really, like, the kitty stuff was the funny animals and I guess the superhero stuff in terms of its simplicity. But, no, there were a lot of genres that were, you know... God, there are really good John Wayne comics from that pre-code period. You know, oh, they're yeah. just straight-up good westerns and stuff. Frank Frazetta even drew a few of those. So Sure. Yeah, I just... Uh, and, and I agree with you. There's definitely a lot of good material out there from, from that era. I just... I don't know. I, I kind of like, you know, the, the older horror stuff with the with the uh, artwork on the covers and then the story. So it, it, it always grabs my attention. And, you know, obviously back then they didn't... Nobody thought about collecting them because it's kind of like a almost like a newspaper and it's just you know whatever i'll read it and then tie it up or whatever so it's hard to find anything um of that era that's in very good condition so a lot of them are kind of rough but the thing i love about them them horror ones is they they look better like that you know it just gives them that tougher look yeah more character and and you're right the paper was sturdier and i mean that's the thing it was it was still newspaper pulp paper and things but yeah that stuff was just you know, it was more made to la- – although uh, one of the reasons why they're still valuable, even the ones that are in tough shape, is because, you know, how many moms and, and how many decades of moms just threw that stuff out when, you know, the kid was a teenager or off to college and stuff. and Or, or they were donated to, you know, younger fa- you know younger families with younger kids and stuff. So a lot of people came back and found their uh, collections missing. 
Exactly. And now <laughs> nowadays, man, this stuff brings crazy money. You know, I'd I'd, <laughs> I'd really like to get my hands on a um, an original piece of artwork for uh, some one of the older Tales from the Crypt books. You know, one of the covers. Oh, yeah, um, I can only imagine how much those things cost. And you know, there's a new wrinkle now too in original pages where uh, ownership is really kind of up in the air and even dealers are starting to worry that they got them from sources that maybe you know oh i got you. stole them or whatever yeah. it's, it's very interesting right now on where original pages are that are pre bronze age or even i guess you know maybe probably like yeah pre-1980 where, yeah. where it's a lot tougher to track down where the sources are because i know there was a lot of kirby pages in fact that suddenly you know there was a great article about how they suddenly disappeared from the collector's market and that's the reason why especially after that settlement that the uh, kirby estate had with uh, marvel and everything so it's very very interesting so yeah i mean it's kind of th- that stuff to find those kinds of original pages they were already ridiculously expensive but now there's a new wrinkle of oh maybe you know maybe they're, they're they were gotten in uh, <laughs> inappropriate ways kind of interesting. yeah and um that's a good point you know i had never even thought about that but uh who knows who knows how it was yeah. acquired? I mean, well, unless you're getting it from like Johnny Craig's daughter, or you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> or, you're getting or, it from a legitimate person, <laughs> right? Al, Al Williamson's family, or whatever. I and mean, that's the other thing too. You know, it's funny. I uh, a, a, a young uh, writer asked me he wanted to do uh, a biography comic book about Mort Weisinger, the old Superman editor from DC, and he's like, "Who should I talk to that worked with him?" And I'm like, uh, "I'm not really sure who's left." Because <laughs> yeah. The, the youngest guys are probably in their 70s. You know, guys like Len Wein and Marv Wolfman might have done a couple things at the very beginning of their career for Mort Weisinger. But I'm like, you know, Mort retired in like 1970 or 71. So I'm like, that's 45 years ago, man. So I, I don't know who's left that, you know, had that kind of significant run with those, you know, with those kinds of editors. And God, EC, you know, had another, you know, 10 to 15 years. As sure. Far as, as far as I don't even know who's still around. God, we just lost uh, Al Feldstein a couple of years ago, and certainly again Al Williamson, and I'm I'm really having trouble beyond that uh, in terms of who might be left that yeah. uh, that works for Gaines and EC. You know. Sure. I mean, it's it's gonna it's gonna be slim to none at this point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I'd even thought about that. Like you said, it's uh. Who knows? If you came across something, you definitely want to validate it. I mean, I don't think anybody wants to purchase anything that's you know been been obtained in a malicious way through yeah. stealing or. But I, I, you know, hopefully one of these days I'll come across something. Uh, I've seen a couple of them come up for sale over the years, but um, they went for a little bit more than what I wanted to give for them at that point. <laughs> <I> uh, <hear laughs> oh, who yeah. knows? Who knows? You know. No, and you know, well, um, the good news is there is a lot of good collectible stuff out there that has been you know that that's that that is available and it went through proper channels and i, I certainly i think uh, the majority of our list of my listeners and stuff will certainly uh are interested in things that you know are from their childhood and their you know the things that they love i just you know um i got two uh nick carty aquaman covers from the 60s and i always thought nick carty in particular was such an interesting artist decent mm-hmm. cover artist and I'll be looking to frame those in the future and stuff. So I'll be. Uh, oh, that's, that's great. You know, and uh, yeah, man. And well, you're you're a perfect source to kind of talk to about that. In fact, you did me uh, the solid to kind of sh- uh, you know show the the strength of ECC Frames, your company, and uh, frame two of my original Spider-Man uh, daily comic strip. Uh, they're they're full comic strips from the dailies, and it's they're written by Stan Lee. They're drawn by uh, Larry Lieber, Stan's brother, and they're inked by uh, Alex Saviak. So they're, you know, three really great comic uh, creators that were mm-hmm. involved in the production of these. And you gave me a really nice frame. It's uh, it's up on the website at wordballoon.com uh, under this uh, very interview. And people can check it out for themselves and really appreciate the uh, the handiwork and the durability. I mean, that's the thing. These are these are great frames, man. They are they are built to last. You give me a nice UV uh, 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 glass uh, protector. On the, on the front of them and stuff, so uh, they'll, they'll be okay with uh, d- direct sunlight. I try to avoid that, but uh, they got that extra protection. And some fine Italian wood, as I understand it, from your frames, correct? Yeah, so um, 
the the wood that we use on the upper end frames, like what you purchased, is actually imported in from uh, Italy. Then we chop and join everything, do all the mat boards, et cetera, in house. Um, the the glass that you're referring to is um, UV resistant glass, so it's 99.9 percent UV resistant. Again, to you know protect whatever you're putting inside, not have to worry about it fading. We use uh, all acid free mat boards, so in your case, you know you've, you're using paper. So if we would have used um, any type of acidic material in there, what will happen is it'll yellow the item after a while. Sure. Um, so you know again, it's it's about uh, preservation and to be able to display the the items. Well, and uh, the, go ahead. The, I was just going to say that the thing is, if you're spending hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars on some of this original art, don't you want to go that extra mile? And when you display it, make sure it is in a container that really does protect that from, like you said, from acid, from from ultraviolet light and things that that will yellow the paper and damage the 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 thing i mean you want this to stay as pristine as when you bought it and and maintain it uh so that you can again showcase it and then and you want people to see it but you also want them to be able to see it in a safe way yeah and um you know one thing to touch up upon i like i had said we had started the this comic book kickoff if you will for our website eccframes.com um around june this year but the actual shop's been around for over 40 years so it's it's not like this is um you know a shop that we've just opened or anything the business has been around for a long time um we can do pretty much anything and we you know we've got a lot of experience doing artwork and different things so there's there's no hesitation on our end if you've got something you want to send in um the way the way we're doing it right now is we've actually got a on the website. If you go there, um, we've got everything categorized by our standard product lines that we have, and then we've got a custom section. So within the custom section, you can submit, um, send an email over with some dimensions and what you're wanting to have framed, and uh, we'll be in contact. You can provide me with photos, and then I can do proofs o- online and send them to you so that you can you know pick out what frame and mat board color and everything that you want. Um, along with the quote, and then I don't require that you ship me the items because I don't want to. You know, a lot of people are uncomfortable. Just you don't know what's going to happen. It, it could be in tr- in transit and get sure. damaged. Or so, lost. Absolutely, man. God exactly. Right. Exactly. So similar to what we did for you, we can you know make the frames ourselves and um, ship it to you. It arrives at your door. You just take the back off, put your artwork in, close it up, and it's and it's a done deal. And you don't have to worry about anything getting damaged at that point. And it being holiday season right now too. This is a great idea for gifts because, you know, for you, this is something you give to your friend who can afford these big ticket items, but then you can come in and actually provide them. I imagine you've got some sort of gift certificate possibility where could a third party, like, you know, if I wanted to buy a frame for like my buddy uh, Jason Wood, Jason's a big art uh, collector and stuff. If I wanted to buy a frame for Jason, could I, could I purchase one of the custom plans? Is that possible, or is there is there a way of doing that? Yeah, um, we have uh, ways to, to provide gift certificates to you. Um, so that would just be a matter of going online and, and, and looking at our website. Um, and the so, website way, if you, by all means, put out the URL. I'm sure I said it at the beginning of our intro and stuff, but we haven't yeah, this. Yeah, sure. The site's um, eccframes.com, and we've also we also have uh, we have some listings on Amazon. And Etsy, Etsy, we've got more products on there. Just the platform of Etsy is so much easier to deal with. Amazon's been a nightmare, just to be honest. Ah. But um, ah. uh, so we've got a page on Facebook uh, where you can go, and it actually links you to the website. And um, on on fa- on Facebook, we've got a couple of the photos of different things that we've done. Um, also, the the website again, it's uh, eccframes.com. But definitely. Etsy lets me um, customize my products so that, you know, I can have different options, whether you want a specific type of a, if you want a standard acrylic plexiglass or the UV resistant, different mat boards, different things. As to where Amazon, um, you're really stuck with what just one set product. You can't do much as far as variations go. So it's, okay. it's uh, I don't know if, you know, some of our listeners, listeners probably have dealt with it, but uh, it's definitely not a very flexible platform to sell items on. Well, the good but, news is they can go directly to your website, eccframes.com, and, yes. and Etsy and, and Facebook. So, yeah, all right. So, yeah, we'll avoid we'll avoid Amazon in this case. That's all right. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, you sell but, enough. Yeah, oh, yeah, no <laughs> doubt. And But, I mean, we are on there, though, so if you, you sure. know, if you're – 
messing around, you can you can see our frames and and you can kind of compare um, on Amazon. There's you know some of the competitors, and you can kind of see what I was referring to as far as quality goes. It's not the same as holding something in your hand, obviously, um, but you can you can look at them and, and get an idea of ours compared to to what's out there right now. Um, everything that we do is solid wood frames. Again, some of the competitors. Um, not only competitors, even if you go to some some framers, it's uh, they use the, a compressed sawdust. Yeah. Which what the problem is is if you have it hanging on the wall and and it's there's a lot of sunlight or moisture, it'll actually start to warp. And if so, if you've got a graded comic in there or even a regular comic, it's going to bend. And if it's a graded comic, um, it could it could possibly crack the the plastic. Oh, wow. So, you know, like I said, it's uh, it's it's what we're trying to do is just provide a very high quality product at a at an affordable price. But um, I guess to go over to um, in comics and and movie lobby cards, everything that we're selling online, um, collectibles wise, we do graded and non graded. Um, on the video games, we're gonna co- we're gonna start off with ungraded, and then we're gonna work on the graded after that, just because the video games aren't graded as much as the comics and things. Sure. Sure. But um, yeah, so we've got graded and ungraded comic books, uh, and we do all the grading companies: CGC, CBCS, Vault, Halo, PGX. Um, there's some over in Europe, but it, it's very few and far between that you see those. So we're not dealing with those right now. Okay. Uh, so we can do all of those and uh, motion picture lobby cards. You can either do graded or ungraded. CGC does grading for those, so you can do that. Uh, we do trading cards, which we do all of the major companies, uh, Bet- Beckett, um, BCG. There, there's a bunch of them for uh, for uh, trading cards, but on the online, whenever you go to the website, you, there's a drop down and you can pick what company graded your item, and that's what we'll frame to. Very cool. Uh, yeah, and uh, we I do post. I'm sorry, I was going to say, I know you're working with stores as well directly, right? Yeah, um, the, and and just uh, the other item that we've got oh, as geez. a standard. Yeah, that's right. The other item that we've got right now as a standard product is uh, postal stamps. So people have those graded, and um, some of the really you know older ones from back whenever they first started the the postal service here, as far as the stamps go. Um, people collect them because they're high dollar and so we oh, yeah. you know we decided we decided why not we'd go ahead and do a frame for them so that's on there and uh, motion uh, motion picture mylars and what a mylar is is if you go to a movie theater and you're walking to the uh, actual cinema room you know that you're going to see the 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 movie in above the door you're going to see a little sign that says you know um, what suicide squad or whatever it is um, they actually have a, an image on there with the, the the names. It's it's really nice artwork. So oh, yes, I've seen those. Sure. Yeah. So people collect those, and um, so we you know we're doing a frame for those. We've actually sold some out of the shop. People come in and see them, and they buy them. It's just it's not expensive, and it, it looks neat. You know, it's and it it relates back to that movie. So um, we've got frames for those as well. Um, and in regards to shops, yes, we in the Cincinnati area. Um, right now we're dealing with, and that's where we're based out of actually is the Northern Kentucky, Cincinnati area. Um, but we're dealing with, uh, comic book world out of Florence, Kentucky, um, up, up and away out of Cincinnati, uh, Muncie, Indiana, all you have comics. And then we we're doing some work over in the Boston area. So, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, we're dealing with uh, a company called raw Coco's collectibles. And then, um, in Boston, we've got, um, cl- <clears throat> excuse me, comically speaking, and there's a large chain over there called New England Comics, and um, all of their branches are selling our products as well. Yeah, man. Yeah. No, that's so, great. So, yeah, I mean, you, you also, if you want to support local stores in these areas, obviously, EC Comics, ECC Comics, or, or ECC Frames, hold on, ECC Frames is uh, also in these stores, and I know that's, uh, you're you're growing, you're, you're traveling around and trying to make deals with stores uh, to yeah, accommodate... So, some local so, and stuff. Sure, sure. So the ideal ideal of the comic book shops is so that they can basically become a satellite framing shop. If uh, you know, if if you want to go into your local comic shop and they're dealing with us, um, and you've got some original artwork or whatever, you show it to them. They'll take a picture. You can get the get the measurements from you. Send it over to me. I can do the frame. Send it to them. And you can deal directly with them. Uh, you know, it's whatever your preference is. That's but, cool. Um, it's going to be um, – It's you're going to actually save some money dealing with the shop as opposed to buying directly from me online. So if you want to do that, um, we've got a list of all of our 
authorized dealers on the website as well, so you can see if there's one near you. Again, we're you know we're just kicking off this uh, this year with the comics, so mm -hmm. we haven't m reached all four corners of the U.S. yet, but uh, <laughs> but uh, you know we are growing, and yeah. um, I guess if you know if there's anybody listening as well to the conversation that would be interested uh, as becoming an authorized dealer, they could hit us up on online and see you know what they have to offer, and we could go from there. But um, it's 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 a good product. And like I Very said, we, I, can, we, I can attest to that. Let me let me be an unbiased, uh, you know, person that can say, hey, no, this is really, really good. And it, it really does protect uh, your collectible in a way that a standard frame just won't do it. And Rogers explained the deficiencies in those uh, frames that you might get at a big box store or at a retail store that, uh, again, it just... It, it, if you if you're spending hundreds and thousands for this stuff, you, and and you feel like it is a collectible that is going to appreciate, don't you want to protect it? I, I really I can't stress that enough, and I think that's another reason why ECC frames is a really good option. Yeah, and I appreciate that, John. And you know, and like I said, we've got frames going from forty dollars and up. So, and even the forty dollar frame is a nice frame. It's not we use any kind of compressed sawdust frames. Um, Everything's you know acid free. We have the option of the UV resistant acrylic um, in the frames. I think uh, one thing to note is, you know, it doesn't have to be a really expensive comic or collectible to frame it. I th I think it's one of those things where, for example, um, you and I had talked at the uh, convention down in Covington, Kentucky this year, and I had just on display there. I had a little uh, a Deathmate book that was graded by CGC of, you know, the crossover from Valiant Im Image in uh -huh. the 90s. It's not a, like a real valuable book or anything, but it meant something to me. It was my collection. I, sure. um, I, I've got this set of them and, um, I just put it there, you know, so people could see and, and somebody came up, you know, he's like, Oh, you know, I can't believe you grade that blah, blah, blah. I'm, hey man, you know, this is, um, I love these books and it means something to me. Maybe monetarily it's not worth a lot of money, but to me it's worth something. So sure. I, I think, I think the point is, you know, even if even if the item, whether it's you know a game or a card or comic, whatever it is, even if it's not worth a lot, you know maybe it's worth something to you, and it's, and it's worth hanging up on a wall instead of just putting in a box or a shelf somewhere that nobody's going to see it or appreciate it. Absolutely, man. And no, you know this uh, man caves, like I said, and I really think uh, most businesses are cool with when you have an office or even a cubicle about letting your flair show and the things that you like, and that's sure. the thing. It's uh, it's. It's you know a great way to show the kind of person you are and you're proud of this stuff and you want to display it. So yeah, don't put it in the don't put it in the drawer and also don't make that mistake that uh, what I always think of is all the comic shops that I go to where they'll have comics in the window and yeah you want them so that you'll entice people to come in but sometimes man that direct sunlight will just do such immediate damage depending on where your windows are and how the sun might hit your uh, your office or your your apartment your house so you know you want to keep all that in mind when you're displaying this stuff so protect it but also be proud and, and uh, display it exactly and you know i uh i appreciate it john i i think um i think this is really what the industry's needed for a long time like i said i've i just had items and, and we've got a framing shop but i just i had some things that i wanted to frame that i've had for a long time and just i couldn't find anything out there that if it if it was affordable, it wasn't a good product. It just didn't have a very good quality. And then, if you wanted to get a really high quality item without doing it yourself, um, you had to pay literally an arm and a leg for some of this. And it's just and it's still there's no personalization there. It's just I don't know. You know, to well, to me, go ahead. No, I was going to say I'm glad you mentioned personalization because one thing you'll see when you go to eccframes.com, uh, some of the some of the, the pre-made frames for comics are great where uh, Roger and, and, and company have uh, come up with like a gold uh, inspired kind of frame presentation for Golden Age comics, silver for Silver Age, bronze for the Bronze Age, and they look gorgeous. And I mean, again, you'll see them at eccframes.com. Uh, but I think that's a really smart idea. And then certainly because you can custom make stuff, then, you know, yeah, the possibilities are endless. I know we've talked in a previous conversation about like with action figures, maybe you don't have the box. But maybe you, you know, you've got a major Matt Mason. That's one of my favorite collectibles from, <laughs> from Mattel, the old astronaut sure. uh, sure. action figure. And, you know, if you don't have the box, but, you know, maybe put a moonscape or something like that behind him, you know, to, to display it in a fun way. 
And, uh, you know, I mean, the same goes with uh, just statues that do kind of come as is. But, I mean, that's the thing. If you don't have if you don't have uh, the box or anything like that, you know, there's there's some good creative ways that uh, Roger and the guys at ECC Frames can uh, help you out with. Yeah, and um, again, you know, if, if you do have anything like that, we're more than welcome to, to hear, you know, what, what ideals you have. You could always send us a message, take some pictures with dimensions, and, um, you know, we'll work with you on it. That's I don't uh, – I'm not afraid to uh, open my mind on whatever you're wanting framed. We've had a did a lot of crazy stuff, so I, I don't think there's an issue um, with that. And uh, we like the challenge, so for sure, if you've got something that maybe other shops would shy away from, you can send it our way, and we'll see what we can do. Very cool, man. All right, you know it's the end of the year, and I realize that now that we're talking in December. So this mm-hmm. is something that just came to me. So let me ask you. I'm going to ask you some uh, pop culture questions as we wrap up to see if. Uh, what your were your taste lie and stuff? What was the what was the best pop culture movie you saw this year? Oh man, well, I just well, I was kind of thinking you might have just seen a movie in the last month or so, given yeah. you, you, that you're a fan of a certain Marvel character. Well, um, what'd you think of Doctor Strange? I'll uh, I'll leave, I'll just come right out and say that. What'd you think? <laughs> well, actually, yeah, I did watch the Doctor Strange my myself. Um, I I loved the movie. I thought it was great. I thought uh, you know I kind of. Going in, I knew I wanted to see it in 3D, but just because of all the the, the crazy effects that I knew they would have, sure. I knew it would look, would look stunning. I, I thought that it was a really well done movie, um, which, in my opinion, Marvel always does a good job. You know, whenever they first started back, uh, really, really pushing the movies in the in the mid to late 90s, you know, it was a little rocky with the Fox stuff and the X Men and different, but it they've really came a long way, and um, I I don't have any complaints at all as far as the work that Marvel does and their their TV shows um, are great. Daredevil, Luke Cage, Jessica oh, yeah. Jones, definitely mature audience shows. They're not uh, like the movies, but they do a hell of a job, you know. Um, uh, the you know the DC comics uh, movies. I think I think they're okay movies, but the problem is that Marvel sets a bar so high, and then they they release something that just seems. I want to say. It, it just doesn't seem as well thought out. It seems like they get in such a big hurry to do it, and then it's it, it falls short. And then yeah. well, you'll watch a Doctor Strange, and then here comes a Suicide Squad or something, and it's like, oh, it's Guardians of the Galaxy 2.0, right? Here it is. Um, before the Guardians of the Galaxy 2.0 even came out, it's just like they kind of copied off of it with the music and everything, but they, I don't know, like I said, it's like they lose focus, and... I think that the DC movies are good movies. It's just that the Marvel is setting its the bar so high that they just can't compete. Um, I agree with you, and I also know um, things like Guardians were really in production for years before they started filming and and really thinking this through. And if you see the comics, you know where this version of the Guardians came from. And the same goes with you know really a lot of their. Uh, films and television shows they take their time and I yeah think you're I, absolutely right i think dc uh took its time with the bat well certainly the nolan batman movies were great and i do yeah. think that they had a general plan or, or a, a serious plan with superman but um it didn't get the reaction they wanted and they've been second guessing themselves and course correcting within production in a way that marvel hasn't i mean and marvel said it's problems too i mean that ant-man movie sure kind of traded hands a few times uh, before settling on, you know, the the director and what happened. But again, the outcome was it was still a great movie. Even oh, yeah. though, you know, and I also know the same thing with Thor. The woman that's uh, directing Wonder Woman was uh, going to direct, I think it was the second Thor movie, and, and pulled out. And instead, you know, they went with another director, and, and she is now doing Wonder Woman instead. It's weird, though. As many problems as DC has with movies, you got to give it to them in animation and in telev- right, live-action television. I, yeah. I, what what an embarrassment of riches! Four days a week, there's at least one hour of comic book you know material on every night on the CW. That's crazy. Well, maybe they ought to have the people that's doing the TV shows focus on the movies. <laughs> you know? I I can't agree more. I agree, with, and you know they do have movie experience too. So I uh, I I completely agree with that, and it, and I'm wondering when the moment will come where they do finally say, you know, let's uh, you know, let's let our our TV people graduate, or if they can handle it, you know, oversee both. I don't know. Well, I think, you know, I'm not making movies or anything, but so I probably can't say anything, but I would think that it would be harder to keep 
a TV show running and the attention on the show um, there than it would be a two hour movie, I would think. But not yeah, just but, me. So. But also, I think there, you know, there's the there's Greg Berlanti, there's Andrew Kreisberg, and there's Mark Guggenheim at the top of uh, running the DC shows. But that said, they've got all these guys writing for them. I mean, that's yeah. the thing. I really, you know, I, I, I don't mean to oversimplify things, but like, you know, Jeff Johns is the chief creative officer, and you read his DC comics, and and they they feel right. And I know he is overseeing Kreisberg, Guggenheim, and Berlanti, and they all seem to speak the same language. Then you go to the writers' room, and they all seem to speak the same language. So I really do think, very quickly, you know, that that kind of idea spreads around the right kind of people and that you can, you know, again, maybe graduate these guys to oversee and let some of these writers that are writing the good individual stories, you know, become the, the next level of showrunners. I, I don't know. Sure. I, I, it'll be very interesting five years from now to see where the TV landscape and the movie landscape is for Warner. So, you know, uh, Greg Rucka, uh, the great writer, has always compared Marvel and DC as the tortoise and the hare. <laughs> that Marvel has always seemed to be a little more nimble, a little faster, and just when you're ready to, as we were last year, maybe to count DC out from a comic book standpoint, all of a sudden Rebirth happens this year, and I am reading as many Marvel and DC books. It's the same level, and I'm real. I just had Mark Andreco on the show, and he's a he's a prime example of a creator that he's writing Adam Strange and Hawkman right now, and it's fantastic, and it's as good as they've ever been. And it's recognizable and it's clear, but it's still a fresh idea. And, uh, you know, I just think all, a lot of the Rebirth books have been great. So, you know, if it can happen in the comics, I think, and again, it's happening, I think, on TV. So hopefully the movies will catch up. Yeah, and, and I, I think so. They're, they're doing a little bit better now. I mean, I thought the Suicide Squad was good. Like I said, I just, I, I think they were trying to get too much from other movies to, to see if it would work for them. But, um, to, but to answer your question, I guess what the, the favorite thing I've seen this year wasn't even a movie. It was um, Stranger Things. Oh, great. Sure. I, I uh, get to TV, but yeah, Stranger Things was fantastic. I, I just, I mean, yeah, there's been a lot of good movies, you know, Civil War, different things. But I just think that they did a hell of a job on that show. And again, you know, I, I told you I'm really into John Carpenter and they turned that movie on or that show on. And boom, you're back in the 80s. They've got the synth sound, <laughs> John Carpenter-esque sounds. I'm like, oh, man, this is like a wet dream, you know? Wow, that's, that's a great comparison. I didn't even think that you're right. The Stranger Things music really does have a Carpenter vibe. You are 100% oh, yeah. right. That's awesome, Roger. Very cool. Because, you know, and like I said, I, I, I really do think uh, movies and TV are in a very interesting point right now where obviously because you've got the room to tell a much more complex story and char and really look at characters in a much more complex way on television, uh, movies really do have a bigger challenge to like, okay, so what do they do? And right now it's effects mostly, it's special effects, and, but you know again it's it's really tough, and and TV has that luxury of ten to thirteen hours to, to really tell a great story. I, I'm a huge fan of Westworld. I think Westworld has been amazing, uh, and and that's the thing. I really think there are a lot of great genre fiction uh, TV shows out there, whether they're on cable or pay cable or obviously uh, the the streaming channels now. Uh, Man in the High Castle is a tremendous show. And I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to that second season on uh, on Amazon. You know, there's just yeah, we're we're really at this very embarrassingly great time where there's so much good content, and certainly uh, from a television standpoint, yeah, it's blow television's blowing movies right out of the water. Oh yeah, and I I um I'm really excited to see. Um, I think it's in production the uh, Punisher TV series. Yeah, Mark's yeah. Working on it, right. right. I, uh, I I think they did a great job on Daredevil. Um, you know, you've got it's it's definitely like I said, it's definitely an adult show. But you've got Daredevil, the good guy, right? He doesn't want to kill anybody, and then you've got the Punisher coming in that just says, "Hell with it, you know. Let's get this over with and move on <laughs> to the next guy." Yeah. I saw. I'm, I'm really curious to see his show. Um, I think they did a great job on that. Uh, you, you were talking about some newer comics. Um, I'm really into this uh, Killer Be Killed from Image. I think they're doing a great job on that. I, yep. I really like the Charles Bronson-esque uh, um, Vigilante, which I guess that's why I like Punisher. But uh, I just I think they're doing a great job. It's it's uh, not, I wouldn't say, the most original story just because it's similar to like a Death Wish, but sure. uh, different yeah, things. But, but, 
but it's at Brubaker. Yeah, it's at Brubaker yeah. and uh, Sean Phillips at their best, and uh, I completely agree. Ed is. I've, I've been talking to Ed. I hope he's coming back to Word Balloon soon. I, he's. I think holding off. There's there's some announcement that's coming and waiting for that. But uh, I look forward to talking to him about Killer Be Killed. And also, uh, by the way, if you didn't know, uh, Ed's one of their Westworld writers as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so yeah, he's. I mean, you know, that's. I can't wait. I mean, really, like Ed. Ed did so much, and you look at Winter Soldier, and so much of Brubaker is in that movie. Yeah. Uh, and I really think uh, finally uh, he's breaking through the television world, and uh, good producers and good good networks are listening to his ideas and uh, welcome them. And I think that's really great. So we're uh, we're in for some cool stuff from Ed Brubaker, I think, in the months and years ahead. And uh, what else is there? The um... I really like the Scotty Young. I hate Fairyland. I just hilarious. think it's hilarious. Oh God. Oh yeah. You, you know, you, <laughs> when when I when I first got it, I didn't. I seen this little girl. You know, it looks like a maniac. I didn't really know what it was, and it's just hilarious. It's awesome. You, uh, it, you it's just something different, you know. And he does a good job with it. It's fun. Um, definitely, again, you know, he's, you've got the adult version and then the kid version that's clean. So that's another great thing I think that they're doing. So if you know, if you want to read something that's a little bit more uh, adult oriented you can buy the non-rated version if you will um or the mature audience version or you can get the one that's the the clean version for kids and it's still it's still a very fun book i think they did a good job on that and um this new the new the new valiant stuff out i think they're doing a hell of a job with valiant um i know you told me that you uh you know some of the the people working on those books but um everything from uh you know Exo Man of War, Bloodshot. Uh, really interested in seeing that Bloodshot movie when it comes out. But uh, I think the the new um, the new Valiant stuff. They're doing a great job on that. I agree with you, man. No, yeah, a lot of my uh, a lot of my favorite writers and uh, artists are over there right now. And uh, from Matt Kent to uh, Jeff Lemire and uh, B. Clay Moore has a great series over there. Uh, my my friends uh, Jen Van Meter and Fred Van Lenty. Uh, it's it, no, I agree. And you know, I I have. Because of those people, I've started to you know read Valiant. I never read it back in the original days, and I'm really impressed with uh, the the talent they got. Finally met Warren Simons, who is uh, one of their uh, main editors at New York, and I congratulated him. He always had a great eye for talent and putting the right people on the right stories and really creating great comics. He did it for Marvel for several years, and now he's doing it for Valiant. So you're right. I'm paying a lot more attention to Valiant these days, and. Certainly, in the weeks and months ahead, you'll be hearing more valiant uh, people on Word Balloon. So. Oh, that's yeah, that's great. Um, like I said, I I think all their titles are good. Um, they they do they're very well written. The artwork's great. I mean, it's just a good book, and yeah. definitely for him, you know, picking the people out, he's done a great job. And I'll I'll, I'll be listening in to hear uh, whoever you have one. Outstanding, man. Well, listen, uh, you got a great product, and I appreciate you. Uh, you know, uh, reaching out to me here at Word Balloon and helping you uh, promote it. And uh, honestly, I really think uh, now that we're in the holiday season, this is a great time to, uh, this is a good inventive kind of uh, Christmas gift or uh, holiday gift or whatever is coming up, uh, birthdays, the like. And also for yourself to get an affordable way to protect your collectibles and display them uh, proudly in your office or man cave, wherever you want to do it. So it's eccframes.com. And Roger Anderson is waiting to uh, talk to you about uh, getting you the right frame or right uh, box for your collectible. So thanks, Ben. I appreciate that. And um, we also have a promotional code, Word Balloon, that's on the website. So if uh, you type that in, you'll get some savings on your checkout. Oh, that's awesome. And indeed, and he'll know, too, that the business is coming from Word Balloon. So that's right. I appreciate you uh, mentioning that. And I'm sure I'll mention it as well as... uh, as I wrap up the show, but uh, no, thanks a lot, Roger. I, I really do. Thanks, thanks for believing in Word Balloon, and I believe in your product. It's a great product. I'm happy to help uh, spread the word and uh, get uh, people the the right container for their collectibles. I appreciate it, man. You take care. That's Roger Anderson. To learn more about ECC Frames, and uh, if you want to make a deal, uh, you can get some uh, money off if you use the promo code Word Balloon. Go to ECC Frames. Dot com. Thanks again for listening to Word Balloon today. Uh, we got another great episode coming for you later this week, and uh, the hits will continue through December and January and months ahead. Uh, it's going to be a great end of the year, and I've got a couple things already in the bank to share with you before December wraps up, and a few more things that we haven't recorded yet, but will, 
and I don't want to uh, mention any names until we have them confirmed. Danny Fingeroff is back. It's funny, I, I mentioned him with uh, Drew Friedman in my conversation, and uh, Danny was kind enough to wish me a happy birthday, and I'm like, hey, we were just talking about you, me and Drew Friedman. Come back to the show. We had a really nice conversation. In fact, I recorded it today, and uh, it's coming up on the next Word Balloon. So uh, you'll want to stay tuned for that and a few other big names uh, as we close out 2016. Thanks again for listening today. Questions or comments about the show, reach me via email, john at wordballoon.com. You can follow me on Twitter at, at John Word Balloon or under Facebook uh, under my name, John Suntress, and the Word Balloon Network. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2016.